morning, I call your attention to the Great Commission as it is recorded for us in Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Having completed our series of sermons from the Gospel of Mark, before we embark on an Old Testament book, I thought that I should deal with some of this issue concerning the church at this point of our church existence. So I called you last week, if you remember, to what a church is. And this Sunday, I call your attention to the task that is given to the church by the Lord Himself. So if you would just turn with me to Matthew 28, commencing our reading from verse 16 to the end of the book. It says in Matthew 28 verse 16, the Holy Bible says the 11 disciples traveled to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. Jesus came near and said to them, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and be disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Thank God for this passage that is often referred to as the Great Commission of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Thirty years ago, when I left Singapore for studies in London, I brought an Acer notebook computer with me on the journey. When I reached London and when I was brought to the place where I was going to be housed for the duration of my studies, I discovered, brothers and sisters, that the Acer notebook that I brought along with me had a two-pin power socket. Whereas the house that I was brought to stay, brothers and sisters, like in Singapore, they had a three-hole socket on the wall. And so I went to my landlord and I asked him whether he had an adapter for me so that I can use my two-pin notebook uh, 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 power, power socket on the, on the wall socket that has three holes. So he told me, brothers and sisters, that he has never heard of things like that and so he was rather ignorant of electronic things 30 years ago. I brought out a pen and in front of him, I pushed it into the top hole, the top hole of that three hole uh, socket that you find in Singapore in similar ways. And after that, I pushed in the two pin into the lower two holes like what we would do in Singapore. He looked worried. In fact, he was very worried. And he immediately said to me, he said, will this damage my wall socket? And I said, no, no, don't worry, we do this very often in Singapore. And the next question was actually the real question. He said, will this cause fire? He was very worried that what I was doing was illegal and it will result in a fire that may consume his house. Brothers and sisters, as Singaporeans, we have learned how to work around when we face a lack of appropriate adapters and gadgets in the various settings of life. Similarly, brothers and sisters, in Singapore and around the world in similar ways, you find that people have made use of the church for all kinds of needs. People go to the church in order to find out the secrets to how to become rich. Or for some young people, they go to church to find a spouse, a wife, a girlfriend, a boyfriend. Others go to church in order to get help, to ask for money, to ask for their needs to be met by the generosity of Christians in the church. I know, and I think you know too, of some parents who join certain church because they want to have a place for their children in the church in the garden. There are people who join certain schools, certain churches in Singapore in order that their children can have priority when it's time for them to register for primary school entrance and Roman brothers and sisters. So they join the church not because they love the church, not because they believe in what the church stood for, but because of all these various other reasons. 
there are even people who join the church so that they can use the church building for their coming wedding. And so it is, brothers and sisters. People have made the church into all kinds of things for them. They go to church for all sorts of reasons. But we need, brothers and sisters, this morning to learn from the Holy Bible what the main purpose of the church is, what is the main calling of the church of Jesus Christ. The first lessons we want to learn from this passage here in Matthew 28 and verse 18. Look at who is the speaker of this command. We learn there in Matthew 28 verse 18, Jesus came near and said to them, All power has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, brothers and sisters, who alone has such power? Who alone could possess all power, all authority? Brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus Christ here is claiming divinity for himself, that he is God. Because God alone has all power. So it is. The word there, authority, can be translated power. All authority, all power, all authority rests with the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, brothers and sisters, everything that happened in this world, you find the Lord Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords over all the events and all the happenings. God has all power, even over the control of the actions of the wicked people. If you would turn with me to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, and listen to what the Holy Bible tells us of God's power over the wicked deeds of the people. Acts chapter 4, verses 27 to 28. For in fact, in this city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, assembled together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, to do whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. So it is clearly told to us, brothers and sisters, that God has all authority and all power even over the control of wicked people and their actions. Not only that, brothers and sisters, the Holy Bible also tells us and teaches us that God has absolute power over Satan and his actions. If you turn back to the Old Testament, to the book of Job, the book of Job is before Psalms. The book of Psalms. Before Psalms, you have the book of Job. Look there in chapter 1, the beginning chapter of Job. Look at Job chapter 1. And there, look at verse 11 and verse 12. But for the sake of time, I'm going to read for you directly from verse 12, where we find the Lord speaking to Satan. Very well, the Lord told Satan, everything he owns is in your power. However, do not lay a hand on Job himself. So Satan left the Lord's presence. And so here, brothers and sisters, as it were, the Lord opened a window for you to look into heaven and look at the spiritual realm, the spiritual world, and the things that is happening. How Satan planned and plotted for the destruction of people and planned and plotted the destruction of the world and how the Lord had total control over this wicked creature called Satan, and how the Lord gave permission for Satan to accomplish God's will, not Satan's wishes, but God's will. Satan even is under the power of God. Again, brothers and sisters, you learn these things. That when the Lord Jesus said, all authority, all power is given to him, Brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus is saying that He has all power in His hands to save His people from their sins and misery. There is nothing, there is nothing in this world that can frustrate the power of God to accomplish His good, 
goodness and kindness to it towards his people. If you turn there to the Gospel of John chapter 10, look at the wonderful promise and a picture that is given here by our Lord. To John chapter 10 and verse 29, he says, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Brothers and sisters, sometimes as a Christian, you find that you, you are in danger of dropping out. You are in danger of being crushed to death by Satan and by your pressure in life. You have so many struggles and you have so many thoughts about you. Sometimes you just wonder whether you can continue on. Well, trust in the Lord. The Bible tells us if you are truly a child of God, there is nothing, not even Satan, can snatch you out of the hand of God because all power rests with Jesus Christ and that there is nobody who can steal you away from the Lord Jesus Christ. You are saved. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ has died for sinners and you recognize, you confess, you acknowledge that you are a sinner and you need the Lord Jesus to save you. You come to Him, you ask Him to save you, you trust your life to Him, you obey Him. Brothers and sisters, He will come to you, He will save you, He will make you His own. It's wonderful, brothers and sisters, to know the Lord Jesus Christ possesses all authority, all power. And when you pray to Him, you can have the confidence that because He possesses all authority and all power, what you entrust to Him and ask of Him, He can and He will provide for you. Now, often, out of good sense, our Chinese his history shows us that often the Chinese people, when they are in trouble, they like to ask their ancestors for help. So they pray to their ancestors, they pray for them departed their dead father and mother, their dead uncles and auntie, or their dead grandfather and grandmother, and say, please help, please help. We, you, in, when you were alive, you loved me. When you were alive, you loved me. Now that you are dead and you have gone to heaven, and I'm in trouble, can you please continue to love me and help me? Come, help me. No, the ancestors loved them when they were alive with them, and now the ancestors are dead, and even if the ancestors want to continue with the sentimental feeling, the emotional feeling, the, the love for their, their descendants, the question is, do the ancestors have the power? Do the ancestors have the ability to help? No point for you to go and ask somebody to help you when there's somebody has no ability to help you, isn't it? You go to ask somebody to help you when you know that there's somebody has the power. So it is, brothers and sisters, no point praying to a stone, a statue, a painting, and then a departed loved one, an ancestor for help. When they have never promised you the power to help you now that they are no longer with you. And so even though they may love you, they cannot help you. But there is somebody who loves you and who can help you. He has all authority. He has all power. And so we go to Him this morning. Go to Him and you know that He will be able to help you. This person who possesses all authority and all power in His hand, He assigns to you a task. And that's the second point. What is your task as a church? He gives you a work to do. Look at what is the work in verses 19 to 20 of Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And so here in these two verses, brothers and sisters, you find your main focus for your life. People say they are Christians, but they, they, are, they are living and they are doing what the world, everybody in the world are doing. The world look for success in their career. So do they. The world look for the, the money in, 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 
gain riches in this world, so do they. They do not have any difference in their mentality and their focus as a Christian. The Bible is saying these words not because God, God, God is calling you to be out of the world. No, you are not. But as you live in this world, there must be a difference in your focus. There must be a difference in the way you spend your money, in the way you plan for your future. There must be something different, especially in things like who are you going to get married to, who are you going to marry. There must be a difference. It's not the most beautiful person, handsome person, the richest person. No, it must be somebody who is of spiritual value similar to yours. Because your concentration is different from the people of the world. Your main task then, brothers and sisters, the Bible says, for your life, is to make disciples of all nations. If you are using the King James Bible, you will realize that instead of make disciples of all nations, the King James says, teach all nations. Because how do you make disciples of all nations? You teach. And so the King James just simply translated it as teach. And it says, make disciples of all nations. Not the Jews only, not just one race, not Chinese only, but people of all nations, all races of people. A Christian cannot be a racist. A Christian cannot say, mm, I don't care, la. I'm a Chinese, um, I don't like all races, it's just so, so smelly. You know, I only like Chinese people. If you say that, you are not a Christian. You are never a Christian. Because a Christian cannot be a racist. Because you believe that the great God who creates all things, create all people, and God has a, 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 a people that He will gather from all races. Not only that, not only are you not a racist, a Christian cannot be a sexist. A Christian cannot say, only man is good. Man is more powerful and man is more worthy, valuable than woman. If you say that, brothers and sisters, if you think that I give birth, I want in future, I only want to have sons, I don't want to have daughters. If you think that way, brothers and sisters, you are not a Christian. Because who give you children? It's not your wife. It's not your stomach. It's not your womb. It is God. It is God who decides to give you girls or boys. And who are you to say that girls are more valuable than boys or boys are more valuable than girls? You are a sexist. It is a sin. You cannot think that way. Men and women are equal before God. Yesterday I was viewing a documentary of the people in China who, uh, who, who, who have a great in uh, liking for seafood, uh, the people in the southern province of uh, uh, Teochew and Hokkien areas and there's a very wonderful documentary that I was watching and they say that uh, the seafood the market actually starts work at 3 a.m. in the morning and so the cameraman went to this market and it was one of the largest in Guangdong province and there they were filming and they saw you see all these uh, well, fish mongrel and all going to fetch the the, the, the fish, the supply from the ship as the boat and the ship comes on shore and how they have to carry the load on baskets and uh, this and that. And if you look carefully, brothers and sisters, often it is one man carrying the pole on the, on the shoulder. The other side is carried by a woman. So it's not true that men are stronger than women. It's not true. Men and women are equally strong. A woman can carry a baby in the womb for nine months. A man can never do that, brothers and sisters. So it is. You cannot be a sexist. You are called to reach all people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That means printing, preaching, broadcasting, posting, doing whatever you can in any ways you can. There is always a spiritual gospel dimension to what you are doing. You are not just going to advance your career. There is always an invisible desire to promote the gospel in everything you do. There is always this desire that, oh, I do. I want people to know Jesus Christ. And I hope one day to invite people to church. 
That means you are living with this main task in mind. And it's important, brothers and sisters. He says, make disciples of all nations. And I say just now that the King James translated it as teach all nations. What do you teach? Well, if you look carefully at verse 20, it tells you what you are to teach people. It says, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And where do you find this? You find this recorded for you in the Holy Bible. And so you are to teach them the content of the Holy Bible. Everything in the Bible you must teach them. For that is what the Lord Jesus Christ says you are to teach and to, so that they, you can make disciples of all nations. You are to educate people. You see, Christianity is a language religion. Christianity is an education, educated religion. Do you know that when the Christian missionaries went to all the big ancient places, the first thing the Christian missionary would do is to start a, a school, to start a hospital to take care of the physical health of the people but secondly to educate them to, to educate them to take care of their mental health and intellectual health because Christianity promotes learning Christianity opens the brain, the mind to God and to be aware of the surrounding Christianity doesn't ask you to empty your brain sit down there and do nothing Christianity is asking you to learn to put a lot of things about God into your brain instead of being empty. No, the more you feel, the more you know about God, the more educated you are. So you see, Christianity says the first task that is given by the Lord to His disciples as a main task is educate people, teach people. And so it is very strange to hear Christians saying, I don't like to read book. I don't like to go and attend a course. I don't like to read and attend Bible study. It's so boring. No, brothers and sisters. That is a sure sign that you are not even a Christian. Because a Christian has Christian appetites. A Christian has Christian desires. You know that a dead man cannot breathe. And so, when you call for a doctor to verify whether a person is dead or alive, the doctor will come and look for the sign, the vital signs of a person who is alive. They look at you and see whether you are alive, look into your eyes and see whether your eyes show signs of life and things like that. So it is spiritually for a Christian. If you look at yourself in the mirror and if you have an honest opinion of yourself, you realize, like, hey, I, don't, I don't like to read the Bible. I, I don't like to listen to sermon. I don't like to attend Bible study. I don't like to read Christian books. I don't like to be educated. I just want to be a simple faith Christian. There is no such person as a simple faith Christian. You know why? Because the Bible clearly says, make disciples of all nations. It simply says, teach all nations. And if you are not teachable, how can you be a Christian? And so it is important for you to change your attitude. If you realize you don't like to read, you don't like to be educated, you don't like to be instructed, there is something seriously wrong with your Christian life, your spiritual life. Look carefully at this main task that is given by our Lord. He says, make disciples of all nations. And he adds and includes baptizing them. Baptizing them, he says. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptizing them. I want you to turn to another passage in the Gospel of Mark chapter 16. And look at the emphasis that is placed there in verses 15 to 16. The Gospel of Mark 15 to 16. Listen to what Jesus said as it is re recorded there for us. The emphasis by Mark. Then he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the Gospel to all creatures. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. The emphasis here is again, preach the gospel, teach, make disciples of all nations, isn't it? Of all creation. And then it says that whoever believes is baptized. Baptism is not an option. There are a lot of people, especially in the old church, that gives the impression that baptism is up to you. 
You want, you be baptized. You don't want, never mind. Because they say baptism doesn't say. The Bible never gives you this option. Baptism is not an option. Baptism is a command. It is Jesus who says you have to be baptized. It is Jesus who says that you are to make disciples of all nations and then to baptize them. And over here in Mark, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. It is not essential, but it is necessary. And that is a very important emphasis because you see, brothers and sisters, sometimes you believe. Somebody come and you share the gospel and the person believe. So happily becoming a Christian. And then you say you have to be baptized and the person say, yes, I want to be baptized. Okay, this Sunday you come to church, I ask the pastor to baptize you. And the man say, yes, praise the Lord, this Sunday I want to be baptized. And then he left your house, he crossed the road, and he got banged. He died. Is the person a Christian? He's not baptized. Yet. In such a situation, you cannot say that, oh, he go to hell. No, he is a Christian. He wants to be baptized, but he did not live till his day of baptism. But if you are a Christian, you have ample opportunity to be baptized. You refuse to be baptized. I am afraid my father and mother will scold me. I'm afraid my husband and my wife will scold me. I'm afraid of this. I'm afraid of that. Brothers and sisters, till the day you die, you are not baptized. You are never a Christian. You are never a Christian. It is not essential, but it is necessary. Baptism alone does not save a person, but all true Christians will be baptized. And so you have to ask yourself, where do you stand in such a situation? Let me give you two examples. If you turn with me to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, look at the example of the Ethiopian eunuch. Acts chapter 8, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, reading verses 35 to 38. Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning with that scripture. As they were traveling down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? So he ordered the chariot to stop. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. When he believed, he was baptized, brothers, sisters. He didn't say, never mind, la, ayah, you only believe, you sure or not. Why don't you go back to Ethiopia and then in future, when you come back to visit Jerusalem again, then uh, you ask Christians, go and attend church, then we have, we have the opportunity to interview them with baptized. You know, no, no. And uh, if you are really a Christian, you are baptized. Again, for another example, in the Acts of the Apostles, you find in chapter 16, verses 13 to 33. Acts 16, verses 13 to 33. He escorted them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him along with everyone in his house. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds right away. He and all his family were baptized right away. He and all his family were baptized. And if your experience is not the same, well, brothers, sisters, you have to ask yourself whether you are really a Christian. Are you baptized? Do you know that a Christian will be baptized? We come to quickly to the last point of our sermon this morning and we come back to the Gospel of Matthew 28. And I want you, we have already looked at who made the call, the command, give the issue, the command, and then we look at the task given. Now we come to the third point which is how are you to fulfill this task given? Look at what you are told there in verse 20. It says, And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. 
the King James says, And lo, I am with you always. The word that lo, doesn't give you and convey to you what it means. It means, and remember, brothers and sisters, as men and women, boys and girls, we are given to forgetfulness. We forget so easily. Sometimes when I find a husband and wife in danger of a divorce, and if you have a chance to speak to them, you realize it can be traced to this forgetfulness. They have forgotten what they promised on the day of their marriage when they promised for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. They forgot. Forgetfulness. And they are forgetful of all the good things that they have done for one another. They only focus on the bad things. And that's the problem, brothers and sisters, with human relationships. Even in human friendships. And I hope that you are not like a person like that. You know, when people do all the good for you, you forget. And when a person just do something wrong one time on you, wow, you should get so angry for the rest of your life. You cannot forgive the person. So it is really amazing that we are human beings of this sort. We are so unlike God. If God were to take note of this, huh, forget all the good you have done for His glory, and you all sin against Him one time, and God remember you for the rest of your life, you are done, you know. You can never be saved, you know. And yet we are doing this to people. We hate it when people do it to us. Hey, oh, the person so unforgiving. And then we turn our head, we do it to others. We are hypocrites. We are self-centered. We are selfish people. He says, remember. We always forget. That is why Jesus said, this is very important. As you serve the Lord, as you live your Christian life, as you live in this world as a Christian, you are going to face problems. And sometimes, you is so overwhelming and so painful and you forget the promises of God. That is why Jesus says, Remember, don't forget. Don't forget what? Huh? He said, don't forget. I am with you always. Until the end. Always! Until the end. Isn't that wonderful? He didn't say, remember, after you die, huh? I'm going to be with you to the end. No, 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 no. He said, don't forget, I am with you always. Now and always, forever. That is very comforting. Because we remember what happened to Thomas. Jesus was not there physically and Thomas said, I don't believe until I see the new print uh, or sustain on the cross and when they, they knew him, knew him to the cross. Until I see the scar that was uh, inflicted by the spears. Until I see it. I don't believe he's alive. And then one week later, Jesus appeared. And the Lord Jesus assured Thomas, Here, look. This is what you said one week ago. Here, look. Touch. This is what you said one week ago. I'm here. Come, Thomas. Believe. Brothers and sisters, it is the same for us. It is the very the same thing. Whatever our situation may be, Jesus is not here. We cannot see Him. We cannot see. We cannot touch Him physically. Jesus, where are you? But we can be assured because His promise is never, never failing. He says what? Don't forget. Remember? Don't forget, huh? Don't forget, I'm with you always. In other words, even when you are in a place of danger, you are in great danger. Close your eyes and remind Jesus, Lord Jesus, you promised that you'll be with me always and I'm now in this situation. Where are you? Please, Lord, remember me. That was exactly what happened when the martyrs were all tied to their poles. When oil was poured over them and when dry sticks were placed all around them, and when the fire came and lit them, and then they burst into flame, and the fire was burning them up, all of them say, Lord Jesus, into your hands we commit our lives. Remember us, O Lord. Remember. 
Jesus said, remember. They asked the Lord to remember. Jesus said, remember, I'm with you always. They say, remember what you say, that you will be with us always. You see, Jesus said, remember. We tell Jesus to remember too. And so prayer is about telling God to remember. Prayer is to remind God to remember. Prayer is claiming the promises God made to us. In other words, we are telling God, Lord, remember what you say. And that's a very comforting thing, isn't it? Jesus said to his people to go to him, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. He promises them rest. And Peter tells us in 1 Peter 5, 7, Casting all your cares on Him. Casting all your cares on Him because He cares about you. These are very comforting words, especially when we are sick, especially when we are down and discouraged. We are reminded of God's promise that His holy presence is always with us. Brothers and sisters, the Lord has given you a task to do. The task of making disciples of all nations. The task of baptizing people. Now, what strength you need to do this? It is in an incredible task for human beings to do. How do you change the minds, the opinions, the heart of people? It's an incredible, it's an impossible task. That's why Jesus is saying, I give you a task to do. You cannot do it with your own strength. I give you a task to do in your life and you do it with my strength. Remember, I'm with you always. It is with the strength. It is with the power of Jesus. That is why he said, all authority is given unto me. All authority, all power is mine. This task can be fulfilled. This task can be done. If you do it with my power, so we go to the Lord and say, Yes, Lord, we will do it with your power. We are only servants. You are the Lord. That is what Jesus meant. If you turn to Matthew 16 and verse 18, he says there, Matthew 16, 18, On this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will build my church. Jesus will be the builder. We are only laborers. And we must always remember that. With this in mind, brothers and sisters, it is very comforting for a small church like ours to always remember, I'm with you always. Always for us not to forget that because all power belongs to Jesus and Jesus says that He will always be with us when we do His work, Therefore, the population of our church is decided by God. Whether we are a big church or small church, it is God who decides. Our duty is to concentrate on our work, our task. It is up to God to decide who joins us and add to our forces and our population. That's what the Bible tells us if we turn to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 47. He says, every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Isn't that wonderful to take note there? And then again, brothers and sisters, we turn to chapter 5 of Acts of the Apostles at verse 14. Believers were added to the Lord in increasing numbers, multitude of both men and women. And there are many other verses that tells us that it is God who adds it's not we. We do not have the power. This is a, a task that is beyond human power. That is why Jesus said, Remember, I am with you always. Didn't Paul himself say in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 6, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Now I know, I know, I know for a fact, and you must have known also, People saying to you, ah, your church is not growing because God is not with your church. By so saying, 
you are actually saying that God's promise is not true. God cannot be trusted because He says, No, remember, don't forget, I am with you always. Where is God if we have been faithful? That, that is a reverse lesson for us here. Have we been faithful? You cannot say God is not faithful when you have not been faithful. You cannot say God is not blessing our church when you have never done the work that He asked you to do. And so we come back to this, brothers and sisters. The task is given. The task is assigned. If you are not attending to the, the, the task faithfully, if you have stopped inviting people to church, if it is for this reason and that reason you are no longer doing it, brothers and sisters, you are using excuses to run away from your duty. It's very discouraging to hear someone some years ago saying this, I, I, from today onwards I'm not inviting people to church. Why? Oh, because the last person I invited has harmed the church. That is wrong. That is not a good excuse. Do everything you can, brothers and sisters. Make a fool of yourself. When I was once watched a person along Orchard Road, he puts in the in on printed on his T-shirt. He said, "I'm a fool. I'm a fool." And then people like me, I was heading towards him, and I look and I laugh. And I'm a fool. And then behind, when he walked past, you look behind his T-shirt. He say. I'm a fool of Jesus Christ, but whose fool are you? I'm a fool for Jesus Christ, but whose fool are you? And so we have to ask ourselves, are we a fool for Jesus Christ? People say you are so foolish as a Christian. Never mind. But what about them? If I'm a fool for Jesus Christ, whose fool are you? You have seen what the church is. Last week I told you that. That the church is not a place, the church is not a building, the church is a people. God has called out to follow Jesus Christ. This week, you have seen the main task of the church. The main task is actually an impossible task for human beings. That is why Jesus promises that all power is in His hand and that we must never forget He is with us always. When He is with us and He has all power in His hand, can anybody stop us? No way. And so, brothers, sisters and children, we are saved. So let us unite our hearts, unite our minds, unite our resources together. Let us do whatever we can. Life is short. Frankly, brothers and sisters, we do not know how long more this world lasts. As the, as the ratings are going, the world is very, very much in trouble. In fact, tomorrow is a very important day, the 11th. Is it 11 tomorrow? Yes. Russia is supposedly going to shut the gas supply to Germany. And for five days, in the name of maintenance, the German government has said that most likely, after five days, they are not going to turn on the gas supply. And if that is the case, Germany will immediately go into recession. Because Germany depended on Russian gas for three quarter of their needs. That's a lot. Immediately, Germany will go into recession. And when Germany gets into recession, it's going to affect other European countries. It's going to go overseas. And we don't know what's going to happen. It's a serious problem. This is a troubled world. Humanly, when you look at all these things, it's troubling. But thanks be to God. What did Jesus say? Don't forget. I am with you always. Our church will not die. It will only die if you stop the task that God has assigned for you every day. And so let us be faithful in our task. With that, the Lord will gather His people. Let us pray.